It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Debale Chakravarti, who is currently a full professor at uh, uh, Materials and Metallurgical Engineering Department, Indian Institute of Technology, Karakpur. Uh, Professor Devale's uh, uh, research is uh, focused mainly on thermomechanical processing of steels, uh, alloy development, fracture mechanics, and failure analysis of steel. Um, he has uh, published more than 100 international uh, uh, publications. I welcome Professor Devale Chakravarti, and we look forward to your interesting talk. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Dr. Prakash, for the opportunity. Uh, since the uh, RMS Titanic um, disaster, 110 years have passed. So uh, how there has been a continuous effort to improve the impact toughness of ferritic steels. Uh, coming to the, uh, the Royal Mail ship Titanic, starting with a brief uh, history that uh, there were Cunard steamship company they launched uh, two very large uh, steamships, uh, uh, Lusitania and Mauritania um, um, in 1907. And in the same year, two other companies, among them the White Star Line was quite famous. Uh, they decided to um, um, introduce three more ships um, on uh, thrice a week, three uh, ship weekly steamship service for passengers and mail between Southampton, England and New York City. So the first two built were RMS Olympic and RMS Titanic and the third ship RMS Britannic was built later on. Uh, the speeds were approximately 21 to 22 knots at which these ships used to operate. Uh, I have taken from mostly from some reports that I find in the internet and uh, those are uh, shown here. Now, uh, this is RMS uh, Titanic under construction, a photo courtesy of Titanic Historical Society. Uh, the Olympic, the first one of these three, launched in uh, 1910, and Titanic launched in 31st of May 1911. So these ships were uh, constructed using wrought iron rivets to attach steel plates, steel frames to each other. The holes were punched inside these plates and frames and each rivet was uh, heated well into the austenite temperature region, uh, inserted into the holes and, and hydraulically squeezed to fill the holes and form a head. So three million such rivets were there in construction of this ship. Uh, looking into the composition, chemical composition of Titanic ship with uh, a, a comparative grade of as per ASTM A36, which is hot rolled mild steel for structural application, uh, which is used at present. So if we look into this, we find the Titanic um, steel um, contains quite a high amount of phosphorus and sulfur compared to what we use uh, in modern steels now. It also had a good amount of oxygen. Good thing was nitrogen content was low. Uh, nowadays, we allow oxygen less than 100 ppm, but it was quite high. Uh, and one more interesting thing was manganese is to sulfur ratio was quite low compared to the uh, standard steel, even other steels built at that time. So there could have been a possibility that sulfur segregation at certain regions um, uh, could uh, uh, produce iron sulfides which were more detrimental than manganese sulfides because of this low manganese to sulfur ratio because manganese content was also quite low to catch up uh, the high sulfur content. So then coming to the microstructure, so first of all the nitrogen content was low. Uh, so uh, it uh, appears that uh, this steel uh, was not made by the Bessemer process. So it was possibly made by the open hearth process and that even in acid line open hearth furnace because if it is made, it was made in basic line open hearth furnace, then it would uh, have reacted with phosphorus and sulfur and reduce these two impurity. So that's why these elements uh, have come at a high amount in the steel. Looking into the microstructure at the longitudinal plane and the transverse plane, there was some microstructural banding you see in the longitudinal plane which can cause some amount of anisotropy. And there were some elongated manganese sulfide stringers in between that we may uh, naturally find in the microstructure. The uh, steel plate uh, was 1.87 centimeter thick. Uh, bulk head plate thickness was 1.25 uh, centimeter. Coming to the next slide, these are the impact transition temperatures. 
this is the a36 grade steel astm steel built at that time uh, and these are the titanic steel impact transition curve longitudinal specimen is this transverse specimen is this and for the titanic steel this is the trans uh, this is the fracture uh, transition temperature in terms of fracture appearance that is percentage shear fracture versus temperature this is impact energy versus temperature so if we uh, draw a line we will find that titanic steel had a 20 joule impact energy which was possibly the standard use that time plus 32 degree centigrade for longitudinal and plus 56 degree centigrade for transverse specimen whereas the sea water temperature at collision was minus 2 degree centigrade only shear fracture tr uh, transition temperature was also about plus 50 degree or higher so naturally brittle fracture uh, was expected at at such a low temperature because the transition temperatures were so high and we see the uh, cleavage fracture mostly uh, in the fracture surface with some uh, ductile region at certain locations a large uh, oxide inclusion shown here there were several uh, sulfide inclusions and the sulfide inclusions caused cracking in the titanic steel which uh, were found in the impact tested specimens moving to the next slide this uh, is a, a, a photograph from the damaged rms olympic ship the first one that was built we can see after uh, it is launched it collided with the another ship and a severe a severe distortion happened in this portion but interesting thing is to note that the uh, re, uh, that the um, severe bending and twisting of hull plates with missing rivets so we can see the rivet holes clearly that rivets got actually broken and at that time the rivets were made by wrought iron purely uh, relatively pure iron matrix with 2 to 3 volume percent iron silicate slag, slag stringers which were highly anisotropic in property inferior tensile and impact properties along the transverse direction so this is the broken rivet from the ship and we see these are the sulfide stringers these back back things dark things so naturally in the transverse direction the ductility and toughness was very poor moreover the uh, riveting process that i have mentioned that can induce a considerable amount of residual tensile stress and we know the residual tensile stress can be a very uh, detrimental thing from cracking point of view uh, as it cools and shrinks so all these factors made these rivets also quite weak and the rivets failed and the plates and uh, uh, other things got separated so basically these were the prime metallurgical problems that i find about the titanic uh, disaster now the liberty ship story is also extremely uh, important uh, uh, in terms of transition temperature philosophy uh, uh, during the second world war usa decided to build a large number of ship within a very short time so they replaced riveting with welding uh, and uh, mass produced uh, at an unprecedented scale within a very short time but the problem happened that uh, during this four years itself out of 2751 ships only two remained afloat and you can imagine what is the loss of carrying troops and ammunition out of that so a severe loss and we can see the ships were almost breaking into halves uh, along the hulls and decks so primarily the crack was initiated by fatigue the fatigue problem at some corners hatch corners and the steel composition was not that good so it was prone to embrittlement plus weakness was there in the weld because that time that understanding was not there about the weld quality and its importance in the impact transition so which promoted the catastrophic propagation of the crack at hull and deck this is one uh, of the liberty ship that remain afloat in uh, photograph taken in 2000 so on this failure analysis work has been done which is very popular and we have to remember uh, constant stipper from university of cambridge who used the technique introduced by george's charp in 1901 and used the charp impact testing to determine the impact transition temperature and uh, and she has found this impact transition temperature was quite high so from this point only the importance of impact transition temperature was really recognized and we have to credit um, uh, constant stipper for that and impact transition is also uh, regarded as stipper transition coming to the next slide a little bit of fundamentals about the specimens and the mode of loading 
So we are mostly concerned about this mode one loading. What happens in mode one loading? It's a pure tensile mode where there is a principal stress acting in the perpendicular direction to the notch and there is a stress intensification. The principal stress actually intensifies at the notch root and it reduces with the increase in distance. And uh, this is the cleavage fracture stress. So as it exceeds the cleavage fracture stress of the material, uh, we see catastrophic failure taking place from the uh, notch um, root of the material. So there are other modes also, uh, and uh, primarily we are concerned about the mode one, which is mode most detrimental for failure. We know when there is a notch because Sharpie specimen contains a blunt notch and notch in ductile materials cause notch strengthening. And why do not strengthening happen? This is the typical chirpy specimen. Uh, and you may know the dimensions and the notch root radius and other things. But why not strengthening? Uh, a Hertzberg book picture which shows uh, the notch and the material in at just at the notch tip tend to deform. Uh, uh, preferentially, it deforms more compared to the material far away. And to uh, accommodate the deformation, what is created is a constraint. So if there is a one principal stress acting in the uh, applied direction, then two other principal stresses create along the width direction and along the thickness direction, which creates the stress triaxiality, what we call. To explain the stress triaxiality in a little better way, uh, a picture from Professor John Knott's uh, uh, famous book uh, I am showing where the material in front of the notch root is divided into number of equal segments. So we see there is a stress intensification at the notch root. So if these segments deform and the segments are of equal volume and equal size, naturally the segment which is closest to the notch will deform maximum, will elongate, try to elongate maximum and the segment that is far away would elongate minimum. So if, if we see the um, deformation of the segments, naturally they will contract in the other directions. So that may create a discontinuity, but the material has to remain continuous. And to maintain continuity, what will be created is a tensile stress in this direction. Though we are not applying any tension in this direction or in the thickness direction, still because of these constraints, these, um, tensile stresses are getting generated in the other two direction. So this is called the triaxial state of stress in presence of a notch. And the thickness direction stress will be particularly high when the thickness is large. So large thickness is dangerous for toughness point of view. Even if we work with a relatively more brittle material, less thickness is good because the constraint effect is less. So what happens is when there are three principal stresses acting, the applied stress needs to be higher to exceeds the uniaxial yield stress which causes yielding according to the von Mises yield criteria. So actually the plastic deformation is resisted at the notch root and as a result there will be more brittleness, there will be more linear elastic condition uh, inside the material. So stress intensification close to the crack creates varying degree of deformation in volume elements as a function of distance from the crack team to maintain continuity triaxial stress is generated. I'm moving to the slide number 11. Now what is the problem, main problem in ferritic steel? Why uh, does it show such a steep impact transition behavior? The reason is the culprit rather is the high temperature sensitivity of the flow stress. You see the flow stress as the temperature decreases, the flow stress rises sharply below a certain temperature. And there is something called cleavage fracture stress. And this is the curve of fracture stress. So there is an intersection. If we are operating at a temperature higher than this intersection temperature, intersection point, then what will happen if we apply load, the stress increases and it first meet the flow stress. So flow stress means the plastic deformation would happen. And even if strain hardening takes place, there is very less chance this fracture stress would be met. So there is a possibility that material would show more of a ductile kind of a fracture uh, assisted by plastic deformation. If we are operating at a very low temperature, if we increase the load or stress, the stress would increase and first meet the fracture stress before it can reach a very high value of flow stress. So as a result, catastrophic brittle failure is expected. So this is the prime reason for uh, the ductile brittle transition in the ferritic steels. 
and if we think of an austenitic steel this flow stress curve would be much more gradual it would go something like this or something like this depending on the composition but certainly this steep rise will not be seen in austenitic steel so typical schematic showing the variation of flow stress in and fracture stress uh, with temperature causing ductile brittle transition in basic ferritic steel now our emphasis will be to understand what causes the transition in flow stress so flow stress transition if we see there is an athermal part which is less sensitive to the temperature and there is a thermal part which rapidly rises with the decrease in temperature and why we see this kind of things now one more thing we need to remember if we strengthen the steel what would happen this this flow stress curve or the yield stress curve would go up because of strengthening and if this curve goes up and if we see that there is a line of cleavage fracture stress naturally you will see that ductile brittle transition would increase actually instead of looking like this uh, according to my students who have done a good review on this area they say that it will look more like this that uh, the thermal part would increase upon strengthening but thermal part may even decrease but that may not be very important i will show in the subsequent slides now uh, now we have to understand this why flow stress is dependent so much on temperature we need to look uh, into the crystal structure so this is the arrangement of 110 planes in bcc this is the atomic arrangement in bcc unit cell this is the atomic arrangement in fcc unit cell where these are the 111 slip planes in hcp 100 uh, the basal plane sorry 0001 type of basal planes in hcp so we need to look into these atomic arrangements in bcc and fcc uh, to really understand uh, uh, what is happening what is the difference that is causing this so crystal structure and atom stacking so we call it atom stacking how atoms are stacked uh, in bcc between neighboring 111 planes or 110 planes that we need to think one interesting thing is in bcc the slip direction is 111 and a single 111 direction falls on three different 110 type of slip plane you can see here 111 can fall uh, on these three 110 type of plane you can uh, uh, do the calculation based on their miller indices and you will find that single 111 lie on three 110 plane and 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 when there is a screw dislocation along 111 which is the slip uh, direction the atoms arranged around the screw dislocation falls on all these three slip planes so they are not restricted on a particular plane in bcc material on a particular slip plane they are atoms are actually lying on multiple slip planes so uh, it, it's it's called a non planar core uh, here we are showing the atom stacking of 110 planes Uh, in 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 uh, bcc uh, i will share the slides with uh, dr prakash and uh, uh, you can have a look so this is the 111 type of direction in this side so let us uh, move to the next slide prepared by my uh, student rakesh so what we are seeing here it's a little bit of uh, may you may find it little bit of complex i'm trying to explain it's called differential displacement map showing the compact core structure of screw dislocation so first let us see what is the slip direction in screw that is 111 so these are the atomic arrangements in 111 this is the first layer in green second layer in blue third layer in yellow fourth layer in green so actually what is happened there is a helicity in atom arrangement you see there is a this will go this 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 something like this and here these atomic arrangements are shown perpendicular to the 111 direction so this is actually 111 direction which is perpendicular to the plane of this uh, slide and it intersects with the 3110 type of planes so these atoms actually fall in multiple 110 type of plane and if you introduce a screw dislocation core so these three atoms a green atom a, a blue atom and a a uh, uh, yellow atom these three makes the dislocation core and you see these three lies on three different 111 planes so it makes the core non planar and this makes the entire dislocation width and and this distance is basically b by 3 because this green to green is b one bar just vector distance and here this uh, dislocation core atoms are shown here also we are looking into perpendicular to the 111 direction this is this is 101 this is 121 uh, and how this uh, uh, atoms uh, look 
perpendicular to the 111 direction remember in bcc 111 is the slip uh, slip direction and 110 is the slip plane if we see the perfect lattice even we are now looking into the side view of this uh, uh, 111 planes so we see that there is a helicity you, you go this will go something like this so there is a helicity of the uh, atomic arrangement when there is a perfect lattice and when they if you introduce a screw dislocation in, into this actually the helicity reverses so this helicity actually reverses it becomes something like this so uh, these are the factors which are very important that screw dislocation core atoms do not lie on a particular plane and it's a very compact structure it's called a compact core structure uh, and we know when a dislocation core is highly compact and its dislocation width is very less uh, then its its um, movement is very difficult compared to that if it is a planar core and if it is quite uh, well spread out uh, then the dislocation movement becomes easier so uh, overall i try to explain this thing whatever possible uh, later on uh, i may um, explain this in a better way anyway going to bcc and uh, fcc so uh, screw in bcc iron so you see the screw in bcc iron has to remain in the perfect dislocation form because in in bcc the step stacking fault is unstable stacking fault since the dislocation has to remain in its um, perfect form only and it has to move in its perfect form only whereas in fcc material the dislocation can dissociate so these three atoms this blue and this white makes one partial dislocation we are looking into 110 direction which is the slip direction in fcc these three atoms <coughs> two blue and one white makes one partial and between this there is a stacking fault these two atoms are in stacking fault which are at 8 cp position so this way the dislocation the screw dislocation in fcc can remain in a dissociated form which is better and 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 the number of uh, uh, and the area of the stacking fault or the number of atoms that will be in the stacking fault uh, position would depend on the stacking fault energy of the material so the corresponding uh, uh, displacement atomic displacement maps are shown so no dislocation dissociation is possible due to unstable stacking fault in bcc material instead the dislocations are extended spread into the 110 slip planes core structure is non planar and highly compact screw dislocation motion is very difficult and occurs by something called king pair mechanism which due to which there is a strong temperature sensitivity of the uh, yield stress or flow stress in fcc splitting of perfect dislocation into well defined partials with confined slip planes due to stable stacking faults core structure is planar and wide and screw dislocation motion is relatively easier and less sensitive to temperature now we are showing a video here here actually this is the starting position of a screw dislocation core and it will move into the <laughs> next position uh, the screw dislocation moving from its low energy position which is called easy core position to another easy core position and it in this process it has to cross a high energy barrier and in the intermediate high energy position is called a split core position so let me uh, sorry something is right right anyway have a look i repeat again this location moving into next position so from from one easy core position to the next easy core position if it has to move then it has to move through a high energy barrier and when it's the most complex configuration that is called split core configuration so i come back to the and okay now it is working so so this 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 energy barrier is much higher in bcc in fcc there will be two energy barriers because dislocation move into <laughs> one partial position and then it goes into the next perfect position so you may know that in fcc this barrier is 
split into two. So that was a more easier position for a dislocation motion compared to the BCC material. So now because of this reason, the pulse stress is very high. And since the pulse stress is very high, the dislocation, if it has to move one pulse value, this red line is a screw dislocation with Burgess vector parallel to it. When it has to move to the next pulse value, you see what it has to do. It cannot move entire, the entire dislocation line cannot move. So what it has to do, part of it has to move, forming a stable kink pair. It's called a stable kink pair. And, and this has to be stable. Otherwise, if it is unstable, it will again come back to the same line. So this is the time step one where there is a stable kink pair nucleation. So at low temperature, this kink pair nucleation actually becomes the rate controlling, which is quite a difficult process and a high energy barrier needs to be crossed for screw dislocation movement. And that leads to very high temperature sensitivity of yield stress. And then what happens in the next time step, these two kings, these kings are of edge character. You see the Burgess vector is perpendicular. These two under the application of stress moves in the two opposite side and gradually the part of the dislocation move into next pulse valley. And eventually it ends up in the <coughs> next pulse valley. So this, this step is called king pair migration. This high temp relatively higher temperature, this king pair migration of the edge type kings become the rate controlling factor which is much easier process compared to this kink pair nucleation factor. So ultimately at low temperature, this uh, kink pair nucleation that governs the high uh, requirement of uh, yield stress because the pulse stress is very high. The lattice friction is very high. You see the dislocation mobility with temperature in BCC <laughs> Age dislocation is really not very much influenced by temperature, but screw dislocation, this pink line you see, we, as the temperature decreases, it decreases sharply. So this becomes the rate controlling step. But if you think of FCC material, <laughs> this would not be so steep. This would be quite similar to the edge thing. So that is why austenitic steel do not show sharp impact transition, but ferrite steels uh, um, do show that. Coming to the next slide. <laughs> <clears throat> different experimental studies have been carried out just to uh, just this is the thermal part of the flow stress uh, variation with temperature is shown. So uh, different um, um, uh, data is taken from the literature and my student Rakesh Barik uh, who is a very intelligent student has uh, made a, a, a good fit plot showing the uh, flow stress variation here the thermal part is not considered only the thermal part is shown. So average flow stress sensitivity with temperature for pure iron because it is pure iron single crystal. So experimental data were collected from literature. So there is no strengthening mechanisms acting. That's why uh, the thermal part is very less. So the so silent fees that salient features on the effects of alloying elements. Now how the alloying elements play a role. Solute atoms having attractive interaction with screw dislocation. Solute atoms actually have attractive majority of the solute atom attractive elastic interaction with screw dislocation tend to pull the dislocation out of its pulse valley and thereby reduce the kink pair nucleation barrier and the flow stress at low temperature causing solid solution softening effect at low temperature we may see a solid solution softening effect by majority of the alloying elements certain elements have no effect zero interaction like cobalt chromium <coughs> The attractive interaction actually originates from reduction in unstable stacking fault energy, which is called chemical misfit. Reduction in charge density around the solute atoms, which weakens the solute iron bonds, facilitating the king pair nucleation mechanism uh, phenomena. Ferromagnetic coupling between the solute iron atoms. As the temperature approaches the thermal regime, then, as I said, king pair migration or the movement of edge type king segments becomes the rate controlling mechanism for dislocation motion and things become much easier because of atomic vibration. So because of atomic vibration, now the nucleation mechanism is not the step controlling, uh, rate controlling because uh, atomic vibration at high temperature help to push a part of the dislocation into the next uh, uh, pulse valley uh, leading to uh, nucleation of the uh, king pair. At high temperature, solute atoms possessing attractive interaction preferentially cluster around the dislocation, 
which increases the stress required to depin the dislocation from solute atmosphere and hence increases the flow stress we very well know the cotrel atmosphere effect of carbon and many other even the solute element shows the same effect this uh, uh, basically at high temperature we see the solid solution strengthening effect in other words attractive interaction of alloying elements can cause softening effect at low temperature and hardening effect at high temperature theory behind the softening to hardening transition phenomena when no solute atoms are available screw dislocation mobility increases with temperature but is always lower than that of the edge dislocation and therefore king pair nucleation becomes the only rate controlling mechanism throughout the entire temperature domain when no solute atoms are available presence of solute atoms or cluster hinder the motion of edge dislocation we know carbon nitrogen all these atoms have create a, a an isotropic stress field and edge dislocation also has an anisotropic stress field so it hinder the motion of edge dislocation which thereby retard the king pair migration therefore beyond a critical temperature edge dislocation becomes less mobile than screw once under the influence of solute atoms and makes the king pair migration to be the rate controlling so this is the basic concept that uh, 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 that alloying element plays a role so here we see iron and iron x where x stands for any arbitrary alloying element so you see if we look into the thermal part if we introduce alloying element mostly alloying elements may cause a softening it may help to pull the dislocation into the next pulse valley whereas the thermal part if we introduce uh, alloying elements it tend to increase that contribution which we really call strengthening solid solution hardening or whatever now uh, if you ask me my gut feeling is if we introduce elements like carbon or nitrogen this solid solution hardening effect will be very much so instead of this much rise this rise will be significant you see the thermal part rises significantly because of the hardening becomes so important and in this case if we plot the cleavage fracture stress then the cleavage fracture stress basically cuts this thermal part only so what happens here that becomes uh, indifferent so the thermal part and associated strengthening actually leads to a significant increase in impact uh, uh, ductile brittle transition temperature and reduction in impact toughness as we see when we add too much carbon or too much solid solution strengthening effect so we are showing illustration of softening to hardening transition phenomena in an iron with some alloying <coughs> alloy based on the competition between screw where the king pair nucleation controlled and edge king pair migration controlled dislocation motion so we have taken the basic concept from a paper and then uh, explained in our own way the effect that we expect from a heavy high amount of alloying addition moving to the next slide uh, one more important thing that we need to think we all know that in bcc 110 we call a 100 sorry uh, sorry pardon me 100 is the uh, cleavage plane <coughs> now why 100 is the cleavage plane we call that surface energy is very low uh, now i come to know from my student rakesh that he said that it's not that 100 has the lowest surface energy even 110 plane also has a very low surface energy if we see the number of bonds to be broken 110 also is not <coughs> uh, in bcc it equivalents to 100 then why cleavage plane is 100 because there is something called dislocation emission from the crack tip because at the crack tip we need to look into what are the stress intensity factors in mode 1 mode 2 mode 3 there can be a mixed mode of loading at the crack tip and and this difference between this this ratio mode 1 to mode 2 mode 1 to mode 3 that becomes very important there and according to rice the the paper reference is given all these paper references are given here there is a condition it's basically the energy release rate criteria that uh, from this this equation is taken so this uh, gamma s which is crack surface energy by gamma us unstable uh, stacking fault energy if this exceeds this term then dislocation emission can occur you see 001 crack plane 001 the dislocation emission is very difficult we see here there is a crack and these green lines are dislocations emitting from the crack tip 
from uh, simulation studies it is shown so in 001 actually dislocation emission is very difficult but when it is 011 which is actually the slip plane of uh, bcc the dislocation emission is quite significant you can see the dislocations are emitting and as dislocations emit there is a high possibility of crack blunting so this crack blunting can occur if there is dislocation emission. So uh, 110 is not a crack plane because there can be dislocation emission and there can be possibility of crack blunting, which is not there in 100 planes. But if there is some resistance, for example, we have seen that if there are paralytic uh, uh, cementite lamellae present very close to the crack tip, which makes this <laughs> dislocation emission and dislocation transfer, the slip transfer very difficult, then even the 100 plane can become a crack plane. So it's not necessary always 100. In general, if there is no barrier to the dislocation emission from the crack tip, then 101 is the crack cleavage plane. But if there are strong barriers, then the situation may even change. The other planes may also become the crack plane. Why steel is so popular? Uh, we often ask our students and they say that it is cheap, it is very strong and things like that compared to aluminum alloys. But one more thing that we need to uh, remember that Y axis is the fracture toughness represented in terms of J1C because the plot is over a very wide temperature range, minus 180 to plus 600. That's why high plasticity, that's why K cannot be used and the concept of J has to be used. We see the variation of fracture toughness with temperature for, um, uh, for steels, BCC steels. You see the room temperature, the, the temperature of the earth crust at that temperature, the toughness of steel is also very, very high. The compare even more higher than aluminum alloys. So at our operating temperature, the steel is a very tough material. But the problem occurs at low temperature when it goes through <coughs> transition, ductile orbital transition, which cause the drop in fracture toughness at high temperature, very much thermal assisted diffusion uh, because of the open BCC structure that leads to problem of uh, uh, the diffusion control to um, uh, deformation and creep and all these things. So this is we have taken from from one of the papers, which is quite interesting. Now, so far I have talked about the temperature sensitivity of flow stress. Now I uh, focus a little bit on the fracture stress part. What control fracture stress? So let us think about the fracture stress. What happens is if there is a notch, you see there is a notch in front of the notch. There is a stress. Uh, as we say, the stress actually looks like this because at the notch root, there can be some plastic deformation which can reduce the stress. So stress distribution looks something like this. And there is also a very high strain because in the plastically deformed material, strain is very high. So what happens that in front of the notch in steels at a distance of say between 200 to 500 micrometers, Debele, you're, you're, you're on mute. Let's yeah. just going to say that we, we've lost hearing you. De Debele, ca can you check your uh, uh, mic, please? You're on mute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. automatically it happened. So where from uh, uh, I, I muted the previous slide? Yeah, or? yeah. The next one. Go to the next one. This was okay, no? Yeah, that was okay. Next yeah, one. Yeah. So next one. Yeah. yeah. So what happens is the, there is a notch. And in front of the notch, there uh, there is a uh, there is a high stress level, you know. The and, and there is a plastic deformation at the notch root. There may be so as a result, stress drops here. And in front of the notch, at a distance of say 200 to 500 micrometer, the stress level reaches very high, and the strain is also quite high at that domain. So there, if there is a weak constituent like a coarse particle. Or, or a coarse grain or a combination of both, then that makes a very detrimental combination for fracture because either of them can, uh, or, or together they can initiate a cleavage crack because the notch cannot propagate by its own because the notch is a blunt notch. It has to create a sharp cleavage crack inside the microstructure. And that's why the microstructural features become so important. If you have large inclusions, large grains, they are bad especially when they are present at the vicinity of the notch tip because the stress and strain are quite high there. 
if these features are located quite far away they may not be so detrimental immediately because there the local stress is less uh, and the crack may propagate in a ductile fashion up to this point where uh, cleavage uh, crack initiates from this location. So th there is a game of probability also here and these features where they are located, whether they are located close to the crack tip or far from the crack tip, this also uh, is important. So uh, some of our research group slides, uh, uh, we have used a steel which contain very high titanium uh, along with nitrogen, low carbon, and we have found the titanium nitride particles were present at the cleavage origin and at the uh, cross section, transverse cross section, we have found broken titanium nitride particles, which actually led to the cleavage cracking uh, in all direction. This is showing grain boundary carbide particles getting cracked. I don't know whether you were able to see very small, small cracks in the grain boundary carbides. Uh, but these cracks didn't grow because these titanium nitrides were quite large uh, in several micrometer in size and they lead to, led to catastrophic failure. So one aspect that is important is the particle size. If there are brittle particles, some particles that can create large crack, then they can be very detrimental. Now we have to see this slide, uh, this picture, where you see that how the crack propagate. It, it initiated from a titanium nitride kind of alumina mixed uh, inclusion and the crack actually deflecting at the green boundary and somewhere getting stopped. This is the transverse plane uh, to the fracture surface. So the Grain size is also important because the grain boundary, at the grain boundaries, the crack has to change its path. It, it is propagating along a cleavage plane and it has to deflect in a different cleavage plane. So, uh, so the grain uh, boundary is also playing a very important role. So based on this, uh, uh, there are several uh, theories available from quite a long time. And I have taken the schematic from Echeveria and Rodriguez Ibabe's paper, which is showing that a titanium nitride particle initiating the crack. And there are certain steps. First, cracking of particle, which is relatively easy because this is a brittle particle. Interface is very tightly bonded <laughs> and the particle often contains inherent crack. Then the first step is the crack crossing into the matrix. That is particle matrix crack propagation. The second step is the rate controlling step is this the crack crossing the grain boundary. So either of them can be the rate controlling. So accordingly, there is a modified Griffith kind of equation that can be used if the uh, controlling factor, sorry, if the controlling factor is the propagation of the crack from the particle to the matrix, then this gamma effective, which is called the effective surface energy, we have to consider the gamma PM, that uh, energy uh, associated for the crack transition from the particle to matrix. And it involves both surface energy and plastic energy. And the size of the detrimental feature, which is the cracking constituent, we have to take it as a particle size because the particle size crack is now propagating. If the step is here, if the crack propagation across the grain boundary is rate controlling, we have to consider the uh, energy associated with the crossing of the boundary. There can be a, uh, the crack can ha has to stop and then uh, move into a different direction. So there is an energy and which is a higher energy level. And this uh, factor becomes equal to the grain size. So either of these factor can play a role. And uh, we know this is showing the basic Griffith equation calculation. You, you must have uh, gone through this, the strain energy, surface energy, and their balance and all these things. And, and the modified Griffith equation from R1 shows something like this, where R1 has modified Griffith equation. Griffith equation is for brittle material, but he has introduced gamma P term. Gamma P means plastic energy, because in a, in a ductile material, there can even be microplasticity. As the crack moves through a, from a grain boundary, acro across the grain boundary from one grain to the next grain, there can be a very small amount of plastic deformation and that has to be taken into account. So this is also called the material resistance R. The problem becomes in this case, we do not, we cannot calculate this gamma effective. Together they can make gamma effective. Their prediction is very difficult. So people do test, they determine cleavage fracture stress, uh, they determine the microstructural constituent size, and from that they back calculate this, this part. But prediction, but the direct calculation of this constituent, this factor is quite a difficult challenge. 
uh, and this factor may vary quite significantly for example gamma mm the gamma pm term is usually presented in a short range 7 to 20 joule per meter square you may see in benetic steel in different carbide containing steel 14 joule per meter square is a typical value that is used but in gamma mm you may find in literature a large range 50 joule per meter square to 300 joule per meter square and you see temperature gamma mm the paper san martin rodriguez ibabe they're telling which is quite uh, uh, deserve attention that as the temperature increases there will be naturally a lot of plastic deformation so the plastic component the gamma p component may be very high so this can rise very steeply a recent paper from uh, Kawata and Aihara say no. Though, so this plot is this dotted reference plot is from this paper only. They say no, it will be not that much steep. Now, this gamma mm term can also be a, a function of crack size because as the crack becomes longer, the stress intensity factor increases and we know the plastic zone size ahead of the crack is directly proportional to the stress intensity factor with a square term in it. So that also is there. So this actually there is a scope uh, of research uh, performing research in this area. So what we have done actually uh, Professor Claire asked us to look into the competition between grain size and particle size uh, which one is actually controlling. So I have passed the problem to my first master students back in 2010-11 who is Arunim. So Arunim did a very good work and what we have done we have processed the steel we have rolled the steel at different temperature region this is the same steel containing very high titanium level. So intentionally we had titanium nitride particles we have uh, deformed the steel in single austenite phase in intercritical temperature range and then normalized them into different temperatures a low temperature normalization around 940 and a high temperature normalization at 1150. Let me show the microstructure. This is finished rolling temperature 935 that is finished rolled in austenite region. Finish rolled in two phase region it appears very fine the grain actually apparently the grain size appears very fine. Then this steel is normalized into 940, heated to 940, austenitized and slowly co and cooled, air cooled. So it produced another fine structure. And when it uh, heated to 1150, it produced a relatively coarse structure. And these are the corresponding EBSD map. So it is interesting to know, and all these steel contain quite coarse titanium nitride particles. So what we have found that although uh, the best property is shown by this steel, the normalized at low temperature, this blue transition curve, which is at the lower side, is the steel, which is having fine grain with very low fraction of low angle boundaries and the grain boundaries are mostly high angle. So fine grain, lot of high angle boundaries, less number of low angle boundaries is the microstructure that we look for. This showed the worst transition. You see the green line, the very coarse grain, naturally very coarse grain structure is bad. But it is interesting that these two steel showed very similar transition behavior although microstructure wise this looks very fine. Problem is although it contains a fine structure there was a lot of low angle boundaries and the low angle boundaries are actually ineffective in retarding the cleavage crack propagation and moreover they increase the stress of the material. The moreover they increase the ill stress level of the material and naturally they shift the ductile brittle transition to the higher side. So this shows that we cannot completely rely on the optical microstructure, metallographic structure, but look into the EBSD uh, more carefully. <coughs> the uh, grain boundary misorientation and the nature of boundaries, etc. So low DVDT at fine ferrite grain size, fine effective grain size, low intensity of low angle boundaries, what we should look for to get a high impact toughness. And when we refine the precipitates even further, when we have very fine grain structure, even finer grain structure, see the previous uh, the previous curve that I, I have shown are in blue lines and this transition curve is in red line. So naturally fine grain, fine particle provides the best combination. Coarse grain, coarse particle makes the worst combination because there can be competition. There can be coarse grain, fine particle or fine grain, coarse particle and uh, and and their other combinations. So based on this, so you see this this steel, fine, very fine particle, small nanometer size precipitates with small grain size provided the best impact transition. So based on that, Arunim has proposed a very good, uh, nice, very simple theory that he said among this particle control fracture or gain control fracture, that means uh, sigma f either particle control or grain control, the crack ultimately has to propagate through the interface, particle matrix interface, and then through the grain boundary. 
so whichever value is the higher value that will be let controlling because that stress have to be achieved for the crack to propagate so he has uh, made this plot i'm trying to explain this plot uh, a local fracture stress so these straight lines are are predicted for different particle sizes and this curve line is predicted considering different grain size so if we refine grain size in this expression that i have shown you earlier we will see continuous rise in the cleavage fracture stress so if we take a particular particle size say 2.5 micron you see this symbol so we have to come this way so it says that 2.5 micron if the particle size that in the microstructure which is uh, the say 90th percentile or 95 percentile controlling particle size then there is a critical grain size if we refine the grain size below this value then only the fracture would be grain size controlled then only the grain refinement effect we will see otherwise if it is we refine it from 70 to 50 the cleavage fracture stress will not be altered because there this particle size actually controlling and the grain size controlled fracture stress is less so this is actually so the actual curve would look something like this and this so to get the real benefit of grain refinement we have to refine it below a particular grain size considering a particular particle size when crack initiates at particles and passes through the grain boundaries for any particle size there exists a critical grain size when the grain size become finer than that size then only the fracture stress become grain size controlled uh this slide i have taken from uh, dr bhattacharji devashish bhattacharji professor not and professor devis's paper in metrans what they have done facet evst ebst on the cleavage facet so it must be a very a time taking process a single facet they have shown comprised of multiple cleavage facets and those cleavage facets were separated by low angle boundaries you may see the boundary between these facets between the different uh, crystals 4 degree 6 degree 8 degree and they have said that 12 degrees the critical misorientation so this is the concept of effective grain size that metallographic grain size is not the controlling factor but we need to refine the microstructure uh, so that the effective grain size is actually refined so the grain boundary misorientation actually plays a very important role so similarly kim et al on benetic microstructure has shown that uh, benite lath boundaries or block boundaries are not very effective rather packet boundary is effective the crack is reflecting at the packet boundary only because these boundaries are low angle boundaries so angular misorientation Uh, that concept become very popular from then so there are different theories how to define that effective boundary that can effectively deviate or deflect a cleavage crack so so there are several references this is available in our in in ghoshetal abhijit's paper uh, in scripta uh, so someone taken 5 degree dr bhattacharya uh, and dr devis they have taken 12 degree 15 degree so there are different theories now what abhijit my research student he said it's not that the misorientation that is important we have to think about the angle between actually the cleavage planes so he has shown a very simple model so let us take g1 and g2 two crystal their their orientation is well defined so g1 you can see the orientation g2 you can see the orientation and accordingly they are drawn and the nd direction is 001 direction according if we if we go by the angular misorientation as per ebst which is as per the angle axis pair so this they will take as the common axis and there is a 45 degree angular deviation so this angle must be a very effective uh, uh, barrier to the uh, to the crack propagation but you see if you if you extend these two crack planes actually these may not be very effective because they are they are on the same plane basically the the crack plane angle the planes are actually 100 planes are very similar so the crack can very easily propagate like this there may not be deflection although there is a high misorientation angle so he has uh, maintained one uh, crystal constant and varied this orientation of g2 all possible orientation that can be uh, possible in bcc uh, uh, structure and he has plotted grain boundary misorientation so this is actually this orientation so first orientation is this second orientation is this we see a very uh, quite a high angular deflection this is the angular deflection as per grain boundary misorientation it is showing 45 degree but actually if we see the angular dis, uh, misorientation between cleavage plane 
actually you will find that angle is very less so this color code represents the actual angular uh, deviation between this is the mistake 100 plane misorientation so that will be very less so we have to consider the 100 plane misorientation that is according to him and he has uh, uh, he has proposed a nice model where he showed that what we do in uh, in uh, Uh, EBST, we actually do the scanning of a particular plane. We do the section plane. Uh, uh, when we do scanning uh, at the plane perpendicular to the fracture surface, and there we can see the secondary cracks. So he said there is not necessary to perform facet facet EBST because facet EBST is a very tedious task because the uh, the ray that comes out are often obstructed by the surrounding. Uh, the cleavage uh, uh, ridges so he said if we do uh, ebst of the secondary cracks that would be good enough because you see what he is showing that this blue is one cleavage plane of one crystal this ash color plane is the uh, next uh, cleavage plane of the adjacent crystal so crack is actually moving from this to this so there is plane normal there are two plane normals but what we are doing is on the uh, on the on the sectional plane we do ebst so what we see we see a crack path like this we see a crack path like this and from ebst we can know the orientation of these individual crystals but actually you see what we are seeing we are seeing basically something like this this is my ebst plane section plane and we are seeing something the line that we are seeing is the intersection of the cleavage plane with the Uh, section plane on which EBST scan is performed. Now, this cleavage plane can be something like this. This cleavage plane can be something like this as well. We can, we may get the same line if it's something like this, and we may get the same line if it's something like this. So, this this can actually change for a single line. This cleavage plane orientation can be changed. We may still see a single line. So, what? model he is proposing a very simple at the notch root suppose there is a crystal there are three 100 planes 1 2 3 now out of these three which plane actually uh, uh, the crack will propagate the crack will propagate in that plane which uh, uh, is closest or where the tensile stress is maximum so that is the first uh, the crack will initially propagate in that plane which makes the minimum angle with the fracture plane when it propagates into the next crystal it will again find three possibilities because again the next bcc crystal will have 3100 so now so there is a 3 into 3 there is nine possibilities now according to him among these nine possibilities that possibility will be more most probable where the angular deflection is minimum because that is the least uh, resistance path or more energetically favorable path so based on that uh, he 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 could actually predict from which 100 plane to which 100 plane of the next crystal to which 100 plane the crack is actually propagating and how much it is deflecting only assumption here being crack is propagating along the 100 which may be a reasonable assumption because mostly that happens but if other planes such as 110 or some other planes leading to crack propagation then uh, that the, the situation may change i think my time is up still i would like to continue to record my presentation later on you may see okay so pardon me uh, i am continuing uh, i could not finish in time i am sorry okay so one more thing is very important uh, those who are meeting and other things you may feel, kindly feel free to leave uh, uh, so one more thing is uh, important uh, what do you say professor prakash shall i continue or shall i stop what do you suggest ha huh? i think um, most of the people may have the uh, meetings so okay. probably right. you can okay. quickly go through okay i can quickly yeah. so one more thing is very important is uh, 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 grain boundary nature is also important whether it's a tilt boundary or the twist boundary twist boundary means something like this that this is this is a twist boundary so uh, so twist boundary means the crack is actually propagating from one um, uh, plane uh, cleavage plane and then it has to uh, create a ridge it has to create a ridge you see uh, a ridge is created here huh? and then it is moving into the next plane so some of the ebst scan has been performed from here and here and so the twist twist uh, proportion the proportion of the twist boundary play a very important role you see the crack 
if it is propagating like this, then here it has to cross this grain boundary ridge. It has to go through a step jump. So twist boundary, if we can increase, the toughness would increase. Let me quickly finish in one minute. Arya, what he has done, he has done this work on martensitic steel, where the microstructure is more complex. The same concept that I have already told, he has used that. This is the cleavage crack propagation to different martensitic variants. And martensitic variants, there is a way of represent, uh, they, they, they have a particular way of arrangement. You see, this is the way of arrangement of the martensitic variants to minimize the strain energy of transformation. So uh, this uh, can be predicted according to my students that uh, there is a there is a something called austenite rec reconstruction and then coming back and they could tell from where to where the crack is propagating from which barrier to which barrier and they say that percentage wise martensite block boundaries are more effective in deflecting cricket crack path than martensite packet boundaries. So this is quite an interesting in the same concept I think what I have said. Uh, Rakesh has recently done some work on uh, on the effect of uh, nodule size in uh, paralytic microstructure and he has found the impact toughness in paralytic microstructure is very much is quite well uh, related to the nodule size compared to interlamellar spacing because the inside the nodule the orientation remains almost the same. And one more thing we have found in recent studies which Rakesh and Abhishek who is also working with Professor Claire uh, and me that uh, when the crack propagates from one constituent to another constituent, sometimes it stops, say from benite to ferrite, or from lamellar perlite to coarse perlite to fine perlite, or from perlite with one particular arrangement of lamellae to another. Here the lamellae is parallel, here the lamellae is perpendicular. The crack can stop. The reason is the local stress intensity factor is changing, and as a result, the crack velocity can change. So, if we can have a multiphase microstructure, there can be a possibility that uh, we can stop the crack. So, I think mostly these things uh, I have kept. I'm skipping the slides. So, I'm very thankful to my institute, uh, which is located at the eastern part. Professor Jijira, I'm very thankful because he introduced me with Professor Prakash, and I am uh, helping one of their students. Uh, and uh, you, you may know that Professor uh, Lord Bhattacharya has been an alumnus of um, Mechanical Engineering Department of our institute. Uh, and, and all these three people, Sundar Pichai is Google, and uh, they, they are quite famous people uh, in our department. This is our department, and some of our very old, uh, the, uh, the founder members of our department. And these are my students. Okay, so um, uh, the Arunim and Abhijit and Arjo and Rakesh and all, all I'm very fortunate to have uh, very good students. So thank you, Professor uh, Prakash, for the nice opportunity. Sorry. What is the maximum combination of strength and toughness you can get for a BCC material? Yes, it's a very good question. I, uh, I what is coming to my mind is I think both, because uh, you see the elements like nickel actually their softening effect is quite strong. So there are different strategies. One strategy is grain refinement, a microstructural refinement. Cleanliness is of course the most important. Whoever says what, that ultimately very clean steel is very important. Uh, and uh, maybe we are saying a lot of other things, but cleanliness is possibly the most important aspect as we have found. And then, microstructural control, microstructural refinement to increase the fracture stress. On the other hand, I would also say that the yield stress temperature sensitivity and certain elements as we know, as we know the low temperature uh, toughness improves very significantly when we add particular elements such as nickel, such as copper in naval steels which are quite popular. So immediately I cannot tell which one is more um, important. And, and we know there are different strategies. If it is ferritic steel, ferrite grain refinement can certainly be a very good strategy with very small particles. On the other hand, martensitic steel, very high toughness, low temperature steels are martensitic steels containing high nickel contents. Uh, so those are also show quite high strength with uh, very low um, room temperature, very low dividity. So uh, I, I would say both. I cannot uh, immediately say which one is more uh, effective because the, because the pr 
problem is quite complex because even if we refine the grain size, we cannot refine it below a certain value. There are a lot of challenges associated with it. And when we do that, other problems come into play because the strain hardening and other factors get compromised when we have gone for ultra fine grain structures. So, so still, if you ask me, a reasonable fine grain, four micron, five micron is quite a fine grain size according to me. Nickel steel, tempered martensitic steel is a good um, um, concept still. So uh, in terms of advancement, I, I can say only these are the possible routes. One more studies recently going on are very fine scale microstructure. That means very fine lamellies of ferrite and austenite, alternate lamellies. So, so that the crack can deflect very frequently. Uh, so that is that is also one more strategy that is being used nowadays. They call fibrous microstructure. Uh, so, so um, this is these these are the possibilities uh, I find, and we have to still find the best way out among them, the best combination among them. Okay, so as a, as a quick, more specific question, then a lot of interest in. Um, the steel industry is in increasing the amount of scrap, which mm. will bring higher residual elements such mm. as yes. So what would you expect yes. the effects of those two elements in particular to be on the balance between yield stress and fracture stress? Yes, uh, obviously. I have not worked much, but we know, Martin, that these elements, this tin, arsenic, antimony, and phosphorus, all these things that come from paints and other things in scrap, they actually segregate at the boundaries and cause embrittlement. So that is a different, altogether a different problem, actually, that, that is the grain boundary embrittlement. Um, but I, I really have not thought about the, in, in, in simply ferritic steel, if tin and other elements are there, then how, how they are going to affect. We, we have to do more studies um, and then we will be able to tell. It is an, an interesting, a very interesting area, interesting problem that you said. If embrittlement is not there, if intergranular fracture is not there, how they are influencing transgranular fracture and ductile fracture, that may be uh, an interesting problem. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Debali, when you mentioned that cleanliness is very important, yes, um, yes, yes. I assume that more with respect to inclusions, right? Exactly. How we can control yeah. the yes, yes, inclusions, exactly. type exactly. of inclusion, size yes. and everything. Mm, so yes. in, in your slides, you particularly uh, took the example of titanium nitrates. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, but but uh, what would be the effect with respect to uh, alumina inclusions or uh, uh, manganese sulfide yes, or something. Yes, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. I will be able to answer this because what we found titanium nitride is a very potent cleavage crack initiator. Okay. So it actually uh, increases the DBDT like anything. Ah, okay. Manganese sulfide, it, it initiates ductile crack very easily because it's not a brittle inclusion. It's a ductile inclusion. So during deformation, it actually deforms and it leads to interface separation. So it creates large, large voids. We have seen this. And these large voids can join very easily. So they hamper the room temperature toughness. Okay. They, they do not have very bad effect at low temperature toughness. They primarily hamper the room temperature toughness. Oh. Alumina, on the other hand, again, a hard and brittle inclusion. Sometimes it gets cracked and it gets uh, aligned uh, along, along mm. a direction. It can cause anisotropy. Again, it's because it's a hard inclusion. It's it's again a cleavage crack initiator. So hard brittle inclusion mostly affect the low temperature toughness as we find, whereas manganese sulfide, it also is bad because it, it, it creates a very large voids and affect the room temperature toughness. The at room, even at room temperature, the steel has a very low toughness. So in your study, you added more titanium to see the effect, yeah. right? Actually, but in yeah. general, uh, mm -hmm. any ship uh, steels, yes. uh, I don't think you normally Absolutely. see that no, high no. levels we, of uh, titanium. Yeah, actually, so, yeah, yeah, right. Okay. We, we intentionally added that so that uh, we see how effectively grains, grains boundary actually retard the crack, whether they are effective barrier to the motion or not. 